Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, October 13th, 2016. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, home brewer Jason Jackson joins us to share tasty saisons brewed with vegetables. Jason looked at his home garden and said, I can brew with that. Steve Wilkes will help me sample. If you're new to home brewing or would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. If you buy any of our DVD combos, you get a free basic brewing bottle opener. And don't forget to get a copy of our Brewer's Logbook. You can use it to log and track up to 50 batches of beer. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. We also have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon shopping, think of us and click on our associate link first on basicbrewing.com. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you the show. We greatly appreciate your support. A bunch of you have been clicking this week. We appreciate it. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes, our Android app on Amazon.com. We have a Windows phone app. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on the Stitcher app as well. We're on Google Play Music, and we're on iHeartRadio the iHeartRadio app. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar some coinage in our virtual guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support, and thanks to everybody who's done so already. Well, let's jump right into the mailbag, shall we? Anthony from Lake Waccamaw, North Carolina, wrote in. I, uh, I hope Anthony and everybody in the path of the hurricane uh, is uh, okay after all the rain and wind and flooding. Not sure where Lake Waccamaw is. I guess, I guess I could have looked that up, but I hope everybody's okay out there. Um, Anthony has been having problems with the contaminated batches lately and wants to sanitize his equipment very well. He asks, what do you think about sanitizing using sous vide? If bugs don't like temperatures above 130, could you vacuum seal your items you want to sanitize and let them go for a really long time, like overnight? I'm thinking about those plastic items that don't like heat above 140 to 150-ish. Some pet, uh, PET bottle companies say their plastic is rated to 140 degrees. Uh, I see a lot of folks using sous vide for brewing, sour mashing, etc., but I can't find anyone using it to sanitize anything. Well, when I first read Anthony's question, I thought it might work. You know, you can pasteurize food for at different temperatures for different lengths of time. Obviously, the higher the temperature, the shorter length of time you have to hold the food at that temperature. Uh, however, 130 degrees Fahrenheit or 54 C is uh, in what the, uh, the USDA considers the danger zone for food. Uh, when you're holding food... Uh, without refrigeration or heat, uh, you know, that 40 degrees Fahrenheit and, and 140 degrees Fahrenheit is dangerous. Here, here's what the USDA says. They say bacteria grow most rapidly in the range of temperatures between 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 140 degrees Fahrenheit, doubling in number in as little as 20 minutes. This range of temperatures is often called the danger zone. So... Uh, it doesn't sound like 130 degrees Fahrenheit is going to be hot enough to do the job, no matter how long you hold your plastic equipment in that temperature water. Maybe maybe if the plastic goods won't melt or, you know, disfigure at uh, just over 140 degrees Fahrenheit, you might be able to do it. Um, who knows? And I'm asking that more than rhetorically. Who knows? Uh, if you're an expert on this type of thing, uh, write in and let us know. What would be the the minimum uh, temperature and, t you know, that you, you can hold something to sanitize it, equipment to sanitize it in, in, say, hot water in a sous vide thing, and how long you would you have to let it sit in there? Uh, Paul from Hutchinson, Kansas writes, I just got a brew in a bag system from High Gravity. He says, thanks for letting me know about the savings. I'm assuming uh, he was talking about the uh, anniversary savings that uh, High Gravity celebrated uh, recently. Uh, Paul says he got the system to, to get himself into all-grain brewing. Uh, Paul says, I'm having a debate with a local brewer friend. I made the assumption all-grain efficiency 
that brewers brag of was mash efficiency. He assumed it was brew house efficiency. We brewed 15 gallons on Saturday, and his five-gallon batch was about 65% mash efficiency with 68% brew house, and mine was a 10-gallon batch with 79 mash and 69 brew house. Do I brag 79% or 69%? Uh, <laughs> Well, I think I, I, I think we might go back to the conversation that Pat Hollingdale and I had a couple of years ago on brewing terminology, and uh, you know, Pat finds a lot of uh, a lot of terms that are out there that people use are, are, are kind of sort of confusing, uh, and he's arguing for some standardization. Uh, but I suppose it's all about your preferences. By the way, you were higher on both numbers, so brag on both of them by all means. <laughs> Especially with a 10-gallon batch, you know. Uh, but so seriously, when I think of efficiency for myself, for my own brewing, I, I look at how much wort I collect, uh, you know, after the boil. And then I look at the original gravity of that wort. And, uh, you know, if those if those numbers are in the ballpark of what I'm looking for, I'm happy. Um, if it's way off, I took a look, uh, take a look at my process and, you know, see if I need to adjust my techniques or, or you know, maybe change my recipe for the next time. But you know, I don't, I don't get hung up on efficiency numbers uh, in that much detail. So uh, it sounds like you 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 got a you got a good system. It sounds like you're happy with it. Good good for you, Paul. Uh, speaking of uh, brewing, I I brewed two five gallon batches at the end of last week. Uh, one was an extract, my 15 minute pale ale, with. Uh, Cascade, Amarillo, and Mosaic hops. Mm. Uh, and the other was an all-grain batch of cream ale. So uh, it was fun to uh, brew a couple of uh, bigger, more moderate gravity beers, bigger as far as uh, batch size. I've been concentrating on the, the you know the smaller or split batches lately and limiting uh, my ABV to around 10%. Or 10%, 2%. The... Um, the extract that I brewed, uh, I brewed it on the stove with my old 10-gallon kettle. Uh, and the all-grain I brewed with my high-gravity system. But both uh, both were fun. And now that the weather's cooling off and the groundwater is cooling off, it's going to be more fun uh, to brew. It's getting, it's getting to be brewing season. There's been a bit of news coming out of our sponsors, Desiree and Dave of High Gravity in Tulsa. First off, they have, a new, uh, they have new lower pricing on bulk grain. So be sure to check that out. If you buy your uh, grain in the 55-pound uh, bags, take a look at highgravitybrew.com. They also uh, featured a, a video on their High Gravity Facebook page. They have, they're selling a new DC pump. Uh, the new DC pump, is it, it's super quiet and comes with a 24-volt universal AC adapter. Uh, you just add a plug that is uh, correct for your region. And it's a uh, it's very small and lightweight, and it's uh, priced at one hundred and forty nine ninety nine. Uh, in that video on their uh, Facebook page, you can hear or or not hear how quiet the thing is. Third, High Gravity unveiled new branding for their electric brewing system controllers. If you go to highgravitybrew.com, you can see the Werthog. That's W O R T. Werthog EBC-130 electric brew controller. It's their newest uh, EBC with uh, automatic temperature control, linear power control, timer functions, and, and a pump control. It's uh, They say it's great for herms or rim systems. You can uh, control a one, two, or three vessel system up to one barrel. So you may be seeing more Werthog controllers out there. Uh, so just know that uh, if you see that Werthog a brand name, just know that it comes from our friends at High Gravity in Tulsa. Uh, check out all the good stuff uh, from High Gravity at highgravitybrew.com. Okay, let's talk to homebrewer Jason Jackson and see what he's been harvesting from his garden to put in his saisons. Well, Jason Jackson, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me. You uh, sent me uh, an experiment, uh, a set of four beers, and uh, 
they were based on saisons, but you decided to do something a little more interesting than just a a plain saison or a spiced saison. Talk a bit about what your experiment was and what inspired you to go in this direction. So the experiment was、uh, kind of working with vegetables in beer and、uh, making vegetable flavored beers, and it was kind of inspired by just my garden was thriving at the time. This was in the middle of summertime, and so I felt like I had all these fresh vegetables. Why not make some beer out of them? And that's kind of where that came from. It's the old "I can brew with that thing." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Well,、uh, so we maybe we'll maybe we'll just reveal the vegetables as we go along,、uh, but let's let's talk about the base beer first.、Uh, you started off with a a uh, plain. Uh, well, it was labeled as a plain saison. I don't know that any saisons are really plain because、uh, there's usually usually a lot going on in there. But talk about your base beer. Talk about your recipe and your technique. So the base beer for what I started with, I made a six-gallon batch of、um, saison. I used eleven pounds of two-row, one and a half pounds of Crystal Sixty, and one pound of flaked rye, and then、um, brewed that with point seven ounces of Magnum for the bittering addition, and then an ounce of Cascade for. Kind of an aroma addition at ten minutes, and I used、uh, Y yeast thirty seven eleven, the French saison yeast, and kind of fermented that all together, and then broke it off into one gallon secondary fermenters and put my vegetables in there. Okay, now that now one and a half of、uh, crystal, and then the rye. That's uh, uh, that's a lot of uh, a lot of.、Uh, Bodybuilding sort of、uh, ingredients. What inspired you to go in that direction? Quite honestly, I I don't really know what I was thinking there. I think I was going for something to stand up against the vegetables because I expect the vegetables to contribute a lot of bold flavors.、Um, so I wanted something with some body to kind of stand up to those. That's good thinking. I think.、Um, <laughs> <laughs> what temperature did you ferment it? I fermented. Well, I started at、uh, I think around seventy degrees, and then I just fermented in a swamp cooler in a big、uh, Tupperware or、uh, big plastic tote with ice water, and just kind of tried to keep the water cool with some ice, but didn't really control it much and kind of let it go at room temperature. That's the、uh, that's the beauty about brewing with.、Uh... With Belgian style、uh, yeasts in the summertime, they they kind of like being warm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what Steve and I did, and and for those listeners who enjoy when Steve and I get goofy, this shows for you.、Uh, <laughs> I let、uh, I let Jason hear hear these clips uh, beforehand uh, before we got on the line. But、uh, but Steve and I both had had a a long work day, and then we and then we went into the tasting,、uh, and so、uh, what we did was we we took each of these beers and tasted them individually,、uh, and talked about、uh, our, our impressions as we do as we were tasting. So let's start off. This is the first beer. This is the plain saison. Steve Wilkes, welcome back to the the、uh, garage studio, Studio A. Is this Studio A? I think so. Okay. <laughs> Down, downstairs is Studio B. My house is Studio C, and Steve's brew shop will be Studio D. <laughs> Boy, that was cleverly. <laughs> that, that plug was cleverly inserted. <laughs> <laughs> This segment brought to you by. <laughs> uh, we are drinking、uh, homebrew. Jason has sent us a flight of saisons. And、uh, they,、uh, the rest of these are going to be、uh, vegetable saisons,、uh, and、uh, this is the the base beer, I guess. This is the plain saison. It's very nice. That's all I have to say. Now it's got that it's got the funk going on. You know, it's 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 nice and funky. It's round. It's real. It's malty.、Mm -hmm. uh, maybe more malty than a commercial ones that I could compare it to. But I really, this is nice. I'd be proud to brew this. Yeah, it's got a nice 
uh, sort of barnyard character to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a substantial malt backbone, I would say, but it's not sweet. No, uh, it's not sweet at all. It's not sweet. Yeah, but and there's there's a mm, it, it's really got it's got a lot of bread like character to it. Mm -hmm. That's very enjoyable. Um, you know, I think I think it's uh, I think. I mean, I don't, I don't know a lot from... I don't know from Cezanne. I don't know from Cezanne. <laughs> but um, among those that I've tasted, I think that this would be... Uh, would uh, fit in rather well, rather well with that style. Uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know that I would call it complex, uh, but it's very drinkable. I think it's, uh, it, it's got enjoyable Cezanne character. Um, it's not super funky, mm. uh, but... Uh, to be honest, <laughs> we're coming off of tasting uh, some some other super funky beers, yeah. <clears throat> so it would be interesting to have tasted this, you know, coming straight from straight from nothing, from street level. <clears throat> this would be a great. I hope I hope we're gonna have a steak tonight because I could definitely drink this with a nice big juicy T bone. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you can conjure up a steak right now, <laughs> uh, I can't do that. that's just where I'm headed. It's been a long day. <laughs> All right, so we've got a baseline now. Well, Very enjoyable. Yeah, I, 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 I would just add that uh, I get I get black pepper notes. I get a little bit of kind of leather notes, like you're going to chew on a baseball glove, which I've done many times. Um, it's it's kind of leathery, peppery, tobacco-y. It's in that area rather than a lot of citrus fruit, mm. you know, kind of bearded guard sort of thing. It's very earthy. I Not earthy kid. Not Earth again. Yeah. Not Earth again. <laughs> I can never do that. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. No, this is very enjoyable. I'm going to drink the rest of this uh, sample, and then we'll move on to the uh, to the rest of the the vegetable beers. So there you go, Jason. Good job. The, the, we liked the base beer quite a bit. Uh, you know, we said we said it was very nice. A bit of a bit of funk. Uh, and we did say round, or Steve did say round and malty. So uh, you know the, that's probably the the contribution of the crystal malt and the rye, but it wasn't you know like syrupy sweet. So I think that it was a good it was a good balance. I think you did well there. Well, thank you. And um, I did want to say I was looking back through my notes today, and I just realized that on that particular brew day, I ran out of propane after boiling for about fifteen minutes. <laughs> I basically just kind of wrapped my boil kettle with as much insulation as I could and kept it as hot as I could for the rest of the boil, I guess you could say. So that may have had a contribution on kind of how it turned out. Now, th th those are those brew days where, in a way, you hope the beer doesn't turn out to be the best beer that you've brewed ever, because if it was, there's no way that you could replicate that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so interesting. So, so it it was kind of a sh kind of a short boil and then a steep. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think that uh, that's kind of Steve was talking about how it's not very hoppy, and I think that that has a lot to do with it because it didn't really get to a boil and didn't get much bitterness. Well, I I, I got to say that it, I think it was it, the bitterness was appropriate for the style. Uh, and with the with this style and with these flavors that you added later on, maybe it was a good thing uh, because I think if you had a lot of bitterness con uh, contribution in there, I think it might have clashed with uh, a lot of the other complex characters that you were working with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so I guess I kind of lucked out there. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you're a you're a you're an honest man for uh, for pointing that out. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> the beer turned out well. You could have said that it was a perfect brew day, and nobody would have known any different. But I, I think it's good. I think it's good when uh, you know. That's why one reason why we have the disaster show every year. It's like uh, you know, a lot of times, unless you drop the carboy full of beer and break it on the on the garage floor, you know, a lot of times when you mess up on a brew day uh, or things go crazy on you, you still turn out with pretty good beer. So uh, it's some yeah. words, some words of encouragement. Yeah. So okay, now let's start out with the uh, cucumber beer, uh, the cucumber saison. Uh, 
Tell us a bit. So you you took the you took the six uh, gallon batch and you split it up into into one gallon sizes. How did you get the cucumber into that section of the beer? So for the cucumber one, I pulled off a gallon of the base saison after it had finished primary fermentation, and I cut up ten ounces of cucumber, skin on just whole cucumber, cut it up, threw it. In a, threw it in a little bit of boiling water just to kind of sanitize it and then put that in my beer for the secondary fermentation. Wow. So it's just cut up, cut up and sanitized uh, uh, or pasteurized, I guess, uh, cucumber just right in the secondary. Yep. Well, that's simple. Um, had you ever used cucumber or, or, or any vegetables in beer before? I haven't. Well, not fresh vegetables. I'd made a uh, chipotle wheat a while back, and I'd also used um, some lime mm. in another in another beer. And for those, I actually I didn't sanitize at all. I just the chipotle one. I just threw the peppers right in the secondary. I think these beers were a little bit off, but I don't know why exactly. I think that the boiling before adding them might have had some contribution to that. Well, not to not to have any spoilers, but I don't know that you know we didn't uh, we didn't encounter any off flavors. Uh, so maybe it's maybe it was just something different from your usual uh, brewing style. That's that could be true, but I think that it also kind of mutes the flavors a little bit. Boiling them, you lose some of those delicate aromatics and things. Yeah, well, I got to say that I I used uh frozen chunks of mango and peach uh in a uh, in a beer recently i racked the beer onto it and uh, i didn't do anything to sanitize the fruit and uh i got a pellicle on the top so maybe it's <laughs> sometimes it's better to be safe than sorry although the beer <laughs> the beer so far is tasting good i bottled it the other day um so okay, let's let's go on to uh, to taste the the cucumber beer, the cucumber saison. Let's go back to Steve and my tasting. Okay, we've moved <clears throat> on to the cucumber saison, and it is different. I don't know if you had not told me it was a cucumber beer. I don't know that I would have picked out cucumber as the descriptor. I would have really. I instantly got. A giant hit of cucumber in my face. It's like a, it's like the, it's like the soupy sales of cucumbers. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I got a giant hit of cucumber in my face. <laughs> a little song, a little dance, a little seltzer down your pants. <laughs> You're one of those clowns standing on the side of the road now, aren't you? <laughs> I hope not. But I no, I got cucumber immediately, and actually I got it too much in the nose. It was the the um, I don't know if you've ever had a cucumber stuffed up your nose before, but <laughs> but I have. So I can... <laughs> we're learning lots of things about Steve. <laughs> all about Steve. <laughs> it's all about me. <laughs> oh, that's a that's a reference to all about Eve. Oh yeah, <laughs> and nobody got that. <laughs> anyway, I got there's a... one librarian who uh, got that out there. Uh, okay, oh. what I got was uh, an earthy character. Which, well, usually when I eat cucumbers, they're pickled. So I guess that's, and now I'm getting pickled. So it's turned about as fair play. That's right. But, um, but it's good. I I like it. I like it too. I think that um, I. This is a criticism, but I I don't mean it like you did something wrong. Criticism, the the cucumber to me when I first uh, smelled it, the bouquet was so strong that it it was um, ever so slightly off-putting. Hmm. Having said that, as it's opened up a little bit, that went away. So uh, the Cezanne quality is all still there from the base mm -hmm. beer. It tastes just like it did. But it has that added dimension of the cucumber, which is actually quite nice. And I, actually, I like cucumbers, and I eat them quite a bit. So uh, maybe that's why I recognized it so clearly. But um, And it kind of reminds me of Hendrix. Uh, gin, which is a cucumber scented gin. Ah. And it 
truly, it reminded me of that. It's like, oh, this is Hendrix. Huh. He just poured a shot of Hendrix in here. <laughs> <laughs> well, he might have. Uh, but uh, but it is, it, it's very nice. Um, the more I drink it, the more my... I'm I'm talking myself into thinking that I'm tasting cucumber, but again my my receptors, when I smell it and when I taste it, I think I I think earthy I don't, and I, and I don't know why that is because usually cucumber is more of a kind of a bright, yeah, character, wouldn't you think? I I agree with you and, well I don't know I don't know what that speaks to because I get both I get the earthiness which but I attribute that to the saison to the base beer and then I get the bright cucumber notes on top of that it is vegetal vegetal mm-hmm. um and at first before we had any of it I was like oh okay a vegetable beer I'm a little worried about this but it's actually it's very drinkable and let's see I, I thought the I thought the vegetation came through a little heavy for me in the nose at first but the as i drink it mm, it's good and and i would have never thought to use cucumber in a beer so <laughs> there you go. is it is it an improvement over the base beer i don't think that's a fair question it's different mm. and um wow i don't know that it's an improvement but well, I don't know how to answer that. I'm I, so you like both equally well. Yeah, I think so. And, I, and so I'm thinking. I always think about like, what, what can I have food with this? Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking this would be really a nice complement to hummus and you know mm-hmm. pita bread and all that kind of thing. Yeah, it's kind of got that Mediterranean thing going with it. And so with that, some with some dill. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'll go with that. Very nice. So there we go. There's the cucumber saison. Uh, we both like the beer. Steve is he's more of a super taster than I am, and he has a lot more experience in the kitchen and tasting ingredients and things like that. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess I didn't I didn't get uh, like a what I'm accustomed to as as far as a cucumber flavor because I think I'm used to eating cucumber with a bit of at least a little bit of vinegar and some uh you know some dill or something like that and so um you know I'm I'm I guess I'm not used to just eating you know raw cucumber by by itself but Steve he swore up and down that that the cucumber came in really strong and in fact uh you know a little a little a little too powerful at first yeah um I the way that I figured out the amounts of vegetables to add, I was looking through um, experimental brewing and they had kind of like given some parameters on how much of certain things to add. If you want a strong flavor or a light flavor and being that it was a say it's a relatively, I mean, the beer is a powerful beer. So I didn't want to, you know, go too light, and not be able to get it. So we can blame those guys. <laughs> it figures <laughs> that's that's denny and drew's book right yes okay well yeah. there you go <laughs> uh, so the okay so the next so we so we like the plain saison we like the cucumber saison although you know i couldn't if you had if you'd not told me it was a cucumber beer. I couldn't have known. Steve says he, he would have. Uh, now we move on to the carrot ginger beer. So talk about how you made the carrot ginger beer. So the carrot ginger, I uh, same thing with the carrots. I used, let's see, 10 ounces of carrots also. Just cut them up. I peeled the carrots. I didn't add the carrot peels. Um, cut them up, threw them in some boiling water, and then in the secondary. And then the ginger... I tasted them about a week later and really didn't get much character, much carrot flavor from the beer when I tasted it the second time. So I figured I had a little bit of ginger, kind of like a carrot ginger soup type of thing, just to give, give it a little bit more complexity. Sure. So how, how much ginger did you add and what kind? The ginger I... I had bought a bunch of ginger root 
a while back and just threw it in the freezer. And so I just have a bunch of ginger in my freezer. So I just sliced an ounce of frozen ginger root and threw that right in on top of the carrots. Simple as you, as, yeah. as the others are as well. So you didn't sanitize the ginger. I don't, I didn't sanitize the ginger. No, it seems like that you really, it seems like the ginger character is going to be pretty delicate and you would think that you would, you would lose a bunch of that if you were to put that in some, some boiling water. Yeah. Of course, I'm just, I'm just guessing here again. I'm not the, I'm not the cook. I'm not the chef. <laughs> <laughs> so okay again pretty easy so let's uh is there anything else that you want to add before we go on to the tasting of the uh, carrot ginger beer um i think that was it for the carrot ginger beer okay all right well let's go to the, back to the tasting where we tackle the carrot ginger saison okay steve we're on to carrot ginger which is my least favorite episode of <laughs> of Gilligan's Island. Right. Well, they replaced Marianne with Carrot, which was nowhere near as good. And the rest, who's a carrot? <laughs> okay, Carrot Ginger. The, boy, the nose on this. It's a schnoz. I'm telling you. It's perfumey. The, yeah. the ginger really comes out um, and is very... Uh, perfumey uh, and mm. smells. I mean, it's good in a in a good way. Yeah, it is. It's uh, and I get the carrot too. I, I so far what I will compliment this brewer on is bringing out the essence of the added thing. A lot of times we'll get beers and it's got ginger in it. And it's like, where's the ginger? I don't, you know, where's the beef? <laughs> you don't know where it's at, but, but in his beers, they're really, these really pop out and carrot and ginger is a classic combination. And this works really well in this mm. beer. I will note that there's zero head, head retention. Mm. And I'm not sure if there's some oil, maybe perhaps, perhaps in one of the two. And I don't know, but some, something's keeping a head from, well, we won't go there. <laughs> Well, but yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, but the 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 flavor characteristics, I don't I don't get. Do you you get carrot? Oh yeah, definitely. I, <laughs> of, course, of course, you're you are you are your culinary talents are 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 you know much better than mine. So, uh, so I believe you when you say that you taste carrot in this in this beer. I taste ginger. First, then the Cezanne characteristics take a back seat, which I can't decide whether it's good or bad. <clears throat> Thank you, Frosty Brooks. <laughs> good or bad. <laughs> uh, but you actually get carrot. Oh, yeah. I, I think it's very carrot-like. I definitely taste carrot. I do taste the ginger. The ginger comes across as uh, spice, a peppery. Well, a ginger spice. Ginger spice. and Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. Even, I walked right into that. <laughs> um, I the the ginger is spicy. I don't taste it as ginger so much as spicy carrot. Huh. Interesting. Well, I, I, I don't know. This is. I think it, if it could be dialed back, like maybe thirty five percent, I think I would like this beer better. To me, the ginger is just a little too much. What do you think? I agree with you, except that I think it's the carrot. <laughs> I get, I get a really. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm turning into Bugs Bunny here. <laughs> your, or, your nose is orange. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But my eyesight's a lot better <laughs> because I'm picking up raccoons on the side of the road, <laughs> snapping them off, baby. <laughs> it's. I mean, it's drinkable. It's good. It's just that it, in on my palate. It's a little aggressive. It's yeah, a, I think it's aggressive. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Dial it back some and um, figure out the head retention, and you've got a killer beer here. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this beer, I could have picked out the ginger. <laughs> <laughs> Even I uh, could have said, that's a ginger beer, because, wow, the nose was really big and perfumey with, uh, with ginger. Uh, I thought that... I, I, I couldn't get the carrot, but Steve says he got the carrot. So I didn't get the carrot either. I just 
I couldn't find it. <laughs> I should have done these, you know, blind tasting to, you know, to quiz him to see what he got. But, you know, sometimes those are fun, and but sometimes they're, you know, excruciating. So uh, I, I wanted to be easy on Steve. Uh, but anyway, I thought I thought it was I thought it was delicious. Uh, I I think that uh, I think I said in the clip that that it would dial it back a bit. Uh, you know, if you were formulating the recipe a second time, uh, it, it was it was a, a bit maybe a bit too much ginger for my for my flavor or for my taste. Uh, what did you think? I I think. Definitely, if I'm going to call it a carrot ginger beer, it's too much ginger for that. Um, but I did. I like the fresh ginger flavor, and you get that spiciness from the ginger. And it and it played well with the uh, with the saison flavors as well, the yeast flavors as well. I thought. Yeah. So I guess it's. I mean, it's just a. Some people like a, t- a lot of ginger, uh, you know, and, and some people more, want a more delicate. Uh, delicate beer and i guess that's the that's the beauty of home brewing is you can tailor your recipes to your own uh preferences yeah yeah it's and it's with this one i kind of get you get more of the like a like a non-alcoholic ginger beer versus a ginger ale hmm. and it's you get more of that pepperiness from it. yeah i can see Spice. that what speaking of alcohol what, what what's the abv of these these are about seven percent alcohol. They started at an OG of ten sixty, and then the final gravity got down to uh, one point zero zero six. Oh wow! So even with all the crystal malt and the rye in there, they they uh, the yeast did a really good job of uh, chewing through that. Yeah, yeah, the yeast definitely uh, took it down, and that's a lot further because I usually I got a pack of. Uh, the Y yeast 1056 about a year ago. And I've just been repitching that in most of the beers that I make. Hmm. And that, I mean, for the most part, it gets down to about 1010 for me. And that's where it stays. And these got down pretty low. So. Yeah. But they've still got that body. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't, uh, it didn't taste that thin to me. Uh, yeah. Not that, you know, 1006 is, is necessarily thin, but, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, I, I was happy, you know, we were happy with the body of the beer. Um, so the, the last combination, the last flavor combination is beets and cocoa. So, so talk about the, uh, the implementation of this beer. So this one, um, I started, I used five ounces of beets because I felt that they would just be really strong flavor and kind of overpower everything. So I dialed back the beets and um, I baked those in the oven basically until they were fork tender, ready to eat. And then I baked them with the skin on and then I peeled them, cut them up, threw them in some boiling water and then in the one gallon secondary again. And the same thing like with the carrots, I added the cocoa about a week later after tasting it. I added two ounces of cocoa nibs. Oh, okay. So the so the the cocoa nibs and did you treat them in any way before you put them in there, or just uh, straight in the fermenter? I think the cocoa nibs just went straight in the ferment. Okay. I should say that between the cucumber and the beets, I actually took the cucumber and beets out of the beer after one week, whereas the carrots I left them in because I wasn't getting much of that carrot carrot flavor hmm, okay so when i put the cocoa nibs in i took the beets out are these one gallon jugs or what are, what are the fermenters like yeah they're one gallon glass jugs like um yeah How, how'd you get the beets out <laughs> <laughs> i i think i um Took a took one of those auto siphons and siphoned it off of the beets. Oh, okay, okay. So rather than take the beets out of the beer, you took the beer out of the beets. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, okay. Well, there we go. It, let's go to the. Uh, is there anything else you need to add before the the final tasting? Uh, I think that was it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So here we go. Uh, Steve and I tasting the beet cocoa. 
Saison. All right, the final beer in the flight is the Beet Coco Saison. Uh, it is. It, it has a pinkish hue. It does have a pinkish hue. It's it's very much uh, from the Borscht Belt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm expecting Rodney Dangerfield to come at it any moment. I get cocoa on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> There's a salve for that. <laughs> no, I get the. I get. I smell. When I smell it, I, get, I smell cocoa. Yeah, I do too. And and, and the, now we agree. So I get the the cocoa powder or the cocoa first, and but I get the beets as well, and they and they play well together. Beets and cocoa are good. Hmm. Good. Yeah. You know, I, again, I most most of the time when I eat beets, they're pickled. Uh, so you know, I'm used to like a tart beet character. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know what I'm looking for when I'm when I'm when I'm just uh, tasting beets. Uh, these do taste like beets to me, and actually they taste a little bit like roasted beets. And I eat beets, just not pickled beets. Meaning, uh-huh. you know, put them in the oven and roast them like a potato and peel them and, you know, eat them. Yeah. And this tastes like a roasted beet to me. Beets me? Beets me. <laughs> so, uh, but but the funkiness of the Cezanne is still there. Mm-hmm. So I would say it's it's still a Cezanne. Um but there's a darker element with the cocoa in there, which is interesting. Uh, you look at it and you think, oh, that's going to be a cherry beer or something like that. But but it's not. No. Uh, yeah. It's. I mean, it's beets. And, it, and again, I taste more beet than cocoa. Hmm. And um, there's a, the vegetalness of this at the end is a little bitter and a little astringent to me. Huh. I'm not saying that in that it's a bad thing but it there is a well if you like beets you'll like this and if you don't like beets you're not going to like this <laughs> that that's really what it boils down to i'm enjoying it I, I think it's a good beer um i don't know that it's my favorite of the flight but it's i think it's more drinkable than say the 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 ginger one the carrot ginger one it, so in, in that it is not as aggressive yeah, in the vegetal or, you know, the cocoa characteristics. Yeah, I think the cocoa softens the beer some, and uh, I agree with your assessment. Except I would say that I think that there's more potential in the ginger, um, mm. carrot ginger beer. I think that that beer has a lot of potential, and I would uh, really like to see that brewed or taste it. You know, right. brewed again a couple of times to see where it could go to. I think this beer is nice. This might be a beer that I'd want to have again with with dessert. Mm. I don't, I don't, I don't see myself sitting down with a pint of this, but I do think it's it's well made, and I I like the flavors quite a lot. But maybe not sixteen ounces of it. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's good. Uh, it's a it's a sipper, as they say. You know, it's not something that you would. Uh, it's not a lawnmower beer by any stretch of the imagination, but it's well made. Um, I think the flavors are interesting. Uh, I don't. I, I, maybe I just need to recalibrate my palate, but I don't get beet. Um, uh, but I do get the cocoa, uh, and I think it's. A, I think it's a, a tasty beer. Yeah, and I get both. I, I mean, I definitely taste the beets in it. Uh, none of these beers were really about hops, which is true of Saison to begin with, but I don't get any kind of conflict with hops that, mm. that you might think could happen. So if you're adding these kind of crazy adjuncts, um, they could conflict real quickly with the wrong hop uh, build. So a great job of brewing these. I think in general with the with the vegetation added, I would just dial them back a bit. Mm. And then see what you get. I th- I think that they might be um, more quaffable. Mm-hmm. They're very interesting. I think they'll be more quaffable if they weren't quite as aggressive. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, it's a, it's an it's a great experiment. Oh yeah, I, I loved the I loved it as as an experiment. This is I would assume the first round, but then the next round you di- is when you dial in the recipe. You try to balance a bit more. Um, and then you go on from there. Yeah. It's very nice. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, James. All right. Now, again, 
you know, here's me. Uh, <laughs> I got the cocoa, <laughs> you know, but again, you know, usually when I eat beets, uh, they're pickled. You know, they're they're in that in the pick in the purple purple pickle juice, and you know, I I don't know that uh, I can't remember when I've had a an actual baked beet, but Steve mentioned in the clip that you know he he t- it tasted like a baked beet. Uh, yeah. So that lit you know gives some credibility to Steve that that he was picking out those flavors. And that's it's funny that he said in the clip that it tasted like a baked beet because. That's the only one that I actually cooked before I put it in the beer. Well, there you go. That's <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Steve is getting credibility toward his super taster status. Uh, it's I don't know how we're still tied on all the uh, brewlosophy things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think that. Uh, you know, we we enjoyed the combination of the of the beet and the cocoa, uh, and the uh, that was the one where I think I think I said that it, maybe it softened the uh, Cezanne character the most. Uh, you know, the others, um, the Cezanne character kind of played with the uh, the added flavors. It seemed it seemed like to me maybe that the that the cocoa might have muted those a bit, uh, but it was still a very tasty beer. I mean. Um, you know, we we enjoyed all of these samples. Um, is there is there anything that you would have done differently on all these? And is there a did this inspire you to plant something new in the garden next year? I think I might next time. I would definitely cut down the amount of variables because I think I would use either just one base malt or maybe a couple different base malts. I think. Between the rye and the crystal and the saison yeast, there's a lot of flavors going on, and you kind of can't judge or uh, you can't tell the vegetable character what you're getting from the vegetables, hmm. apart from what you're getting from the yeast or the rye or anything like that. That's a good point. I mean, uh, the you know the the yeast itself adds a lot of complexity. Adds a lot of interesting flavors, uh, and then you've got uh, uh, the rye in there, which you know people say that they taste spiciness uh, with the uh, rye. Again, my palate, I, <laughs> I I've done a lot of hundred percent rye beers. I don't get a lot of spiciness, but uh, and then uh, and then with the crystal in there as well. So that that may be a good point. I mean, you know, since this is an experiment, uh, you know, limiting the variables. Especially when you're trying to investigate ingredients, maybe that's a good strategy. And maybe um, since you were talking about how you like your cucumbers and your beets pickled, maybe doing like a sour beer Ooh. or something. I like the sound of that. Uh, yeah. Maybe, beet beer. yeah, maybe, uh, maybe is, uh, doing a like a kettle sour or. Or then, or you know, the old-fashioned uh, pitching the lacto or the you know the souring in, uh, ingredients into the the fermenter with the with the vegetables. I think that that's that's an interesting idea. Um, I've been wanting to do you know I do sauerkraut. I do uh, you know sauerkraut that starts on its own. I don't add anything to it. It's just salt and water and and cabbage. And I've been wanting to do you know some other pickled vegetables in that same way. Um, It'd be interesting to do a hybrid, you know, with uh, getting beer in there somewhere. So yeah, I think I think that's a that's an interesting direction to head. Yeah. Well, Jason, I, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I, I'm just amazed at, at the things that you know that brewers are, are doing out there, uh, and I'm inspired. Uh, you know the uh, you know with with Stan Hieronymus, Stan Hieronymus's uh, latest book, especially you know talking about using you know, kind of foraged or found ingredients, uh, you know, this is this is right up that alley. And so I I applaud your effort, and, and I appreciate your sending the beers, and they were delicious. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, thanks again to Jason. It was a lot of fun to taste those beers. And uh, just like when I talked to Stan Hieronymus about his book, Brewing Local, uh, I was inspired uh, you know, maybe I want to see what I can grow in my garden next year 
add some new and interesting flavors to my beers. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. You get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo. You can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store as well. You can find our log books where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all that out at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Kodiak Cakes, Power Flapjack, On-The-Go Baking Mix, Unleashed Buttermilk and Maple, and VV Home Pet Costume, Dog Hair Piece, Lion Wig with Ears. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. And remember... I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget, you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So long.